Okay, so our daily quiz for today, daily quiz number 24. What is the date today? Tuesday, April 27th. So next class on Friday is going to be our last class for the semester. Um, I want to say a couple of things, right? Like um, make sure you go to Gradescope and check whether you have been added to the submissions by your partner or not. Make sure that you you, uh, you guys give it a thorough check. Uh, you don't want to wait, uh, you know, for the last minute. Do it this week as early as you can. Uh, the next thing is, uh, I think the course evaluations are due the last day of classes. That's May 3rd. So if you guys can uh, fill out the course evaluation for COCO, uh, that will uh, go a long way in me trying to uh, make adjustments in this class regarding what worked and what didn't work. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I appreciate your feedback. Please, uh, you know, use uh, the, the course evaluations to submit them. Uh, they're due uh, Monday of next week, May 3rd. Okay, so let's talk about what is due. Well, there's only one homework due, which is due Friday, April 30th on Gradescope. Uh, many of you have already submitted that. Oh, well, there are you are you guys are already working on that, so that's good. Uh, a couple of submissions I think have come in. Uh, in terms of studio, you only have uh, multiple choice equals bad. Only so multiple choice equals bad. <laughs> All right, uh, because there is no partial credit. Is that the reason? Okay, all right. What if there was partial credit? A lot of multiple choices, but that works too. Okay, all right. I, I'll keep that in mind as long as the, the exams are concerned. Uh, for daily quizzes though, they're supposed to be quick. I, I don't want to ask uh, long free response questions for daily quizzes. Um, I feel like the class is focused on making good design choices, not remembering stuff. Yeah, the, if you're trying to remember stuff, then that is a wrong path to take. You will never be able to remember all the stuff. Like I, I've never... No, 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 no. <laughs> don't, don't memorize the IC. That is something that, you know, will be part of the question or... <laughs> The multiple choice is more the multiple choice is more remembering uh, well that's debatable i think uh, a lot of it is understanding see when i rem what i mean by remembering is remembering each and every detail about um an ic for example you shouldn't need to remember that you can always look up a data sheet um, but you know, do you have to remember how active low signals are represented in a schematic diagram? Sure, you have to. That's more understanding than remembering, right? So there's a very fine line between them. All right, let let's uh, let's come come back to the lecture here. Uh, homework due uh, April thirtieth. Studio due due tomorrow. So make sure that tomorrow you submit on Gradescope and also get uh, your Studio eight checked off. Uh, a lot of you have already finished the studio, so that's great. Let me move on to our last lecture for the semester. We are going to be focusing on memory. So when you hear memory, uh, let me just poll the class uh, in terms of what comes to mind when you hear memory. RAM, ROM, okay, so RAM random access memory read only memory ssd solid state drives all right uh, dynamic ram comes to mind all right so this you know dynamic ram is sort of a type of uh, ram uh, what else <laughs> static ram somebody said static ram too all right video ram all right so we are, we are too young for hard drives. <laughs> so, so should I put it in the list? Maybe I'll put it right next to uh, SSD. 
i'll put a very slow hard disk uh a floppy all right floppy now you guys are talking about old things magnetic tapes and floppy i'm going to put that all the way over here uh paper and pencil oh what let's just name storage elements uh when camera roll you want to delete photos to make room okay sure yes uh you are deleting stuff uh you are freeing up memory uh from your phone uh, to make room for new data uh let's see all right so i think that you know we have gotten um a good sense of what memory would constitute uh, in general if i had to classify this i would classify this as ram rom and then you know ram, within ram you got your dynamic ram and static ram those are the two types of ram actually we'll be focusing on uh, looking at uh, what are our different options over there so we'll take a look at those options um we are also going to talk about rom in this lecture read only memory right like okay i just want to read the memory uh so we'll talk about uh what uh, that could be then we have the solid state drive and hard disk even the magnetic the old magnetic tapes and floppy disks those are all supposed to be slow um and they really in context of memory they only have one purpose the purpose is that memory should be large right so whenever you think about memory that is available for a computer um let us talk about a few parameters here uh what what would you want your size of the memory to be large or small big right like you like you want your memories to be infinitely big ideally right as big as possible why because everything is going in the memory the operating system the user applications your user data everything is going on the memory so in terms of size you would want that to be really really big uh all right so how about cost you would want the cost to be as low as possible and you know several advancements in memory uh technology have enabled that our memory has gotten cheaper uh every year every generation all right so cost we would want that to be low now let's talk about speed speed of access how about speed of access well cheaper ram but the size has increased right per bit the dollar amount has gone down uh you would want low latency all right so you want uh speed of access the speed should be high right so you want there's price fixing issues all right so in general whenever your cpu is looking for some in uh some information you would want that read or write operation to happen as fast as possible you want your memory to be very very big and in terms of cost you want that to be as low as possible now if i remove this from the list right so let's just talk about size versus speed if i remove this from the list the cost think about size and speed do you guys think that these are conflicting objectives these are this this could be conflicting uh how how no so it, it, imagine this imagine that you are in a really big library and you are trying to search for a book right if the large if if the library was very very big is it fair to say that you would spend more time looking for the book compared to a very small library yes so the point that i'm trying to make is you get the benefit of size by having a very large hard disk but the downside for that is even though you got a very very big memory you lost uh, the speed 
the speed of access for a hard disk is many four thousands of times slower than what is the, the, the speed of access for a RAM. Right, so if you want the memory to be really big, which the user wants, then you will have to give up on the speed of access. So how do, how do we go about doing this? How do we go about creating a, an illusion that the user has a large memory, but it is also very, very quick? If we cannot do that practically, can we perhaps give an illusion to the user that that is really the case? RAID 0. <laughs> All right, so for, for, a, for a computer, you do that by establishing a hierarchy of memories. So really what you do is, you build up a triangle, you build up a pyramid, CPU cache, that's exactly right. So you will have your cache all the way at the top. And why is it shown as all, all the way at the top? Because the size is small, right? The size of the cache, which is, which is supposed to be right next to the CPU, in many cases on the same chip, right? So the, the, the bandwidth between uh, the CPU and the cache is supposed to be really, really fast. And what enables that is are two things. One, the size of the cache is very, very small in comparison to say RAM or hard disk. The other thing that enables that is because it is right next to the processor, right? So there's no time that you're spending in accessing many, many elements. It is right on the same chip as the CPU. So cache gives us speed, but it is very costly, right? So the cost goes up, but when you use cache, cache is supposed to be the smallest size with the highest speed of access but the highest cost as well. Now, when you go down this, obviously we cannot fit everything into our cache. So we will have the second layer for the memory, which is going to be our RAM or physical memory, right? Now this physical RAM is going to be volatile, which means that if I switch off the power, the contents of the RAM get uh, erased. So it's not supposed to be for permanent usage. It is supposed to be as long as my computer is powered on. It's, it's a volatile type of memory, but let's talk about its size, cost, and speed of access. Speed of access is slower than cache. It is lesser, less expensive than the cache, but it is bigger than the cache but you will spend some time in trying to access the RAM. So the CPUs, what do they do? They look for things in the cache. If they don't find it, then they go to the next highest level of, of RAM. Now, if they don't find it in the RAM, then a couple of things can happen. One, you could have uh, multiple layers of RAM or you might have a, a SSD. So you might have an SSD over here as sort of acting as the third layer in this. Again, bigger size, but slower speed compared to RAM. And all the way at the top, at, at the bottom here, we are gonna have our slow hard disk. Now, the slow hard disk, uh, it's going to give us the illusion that we have a really, really big memory but the user is directly interfacing with the cache. So that's how we are giving an illusion to the user that you're able to uh, have a memory as large as the hard disk, but you are able to access it at a speed that is determined by the cache, right? But sometimes you might have to look for in the RAM. And if you don't find it in the RAM, you'll have to go and look into your higher, uh, lower level memories, right? So. All of this requires uh, data or blocks of memory to be transferred one, from uh, one layer to the other, but the CPU directly interacts with the fastest level here, which is the cache. Uh, right, okay, so you guys are talking about all these things. 
all right let 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 me continue with the with the with the with the lecture here so what what comes below below the hard disk well below the hard disk you might have several servers right several servers that you may be accessing on a network then th that is going to be even bigger in terms of memory but the speed of access for that is going to be lower and lower uh, so that's how an illusion is created for a user that all the objectives are being met but that's not really the case we are we are accomplishing that by having a hierarchy of memories all right so what are we doing today we are today we are going to be focusing on ram there are two types you are going to be talking over static ram and dynamic ram note that these are not the current technologies we are just going to be looking at how they are uh, designed what are they used for how do they store bits of information and so on the current technology is ddr4 right so it, it, it has evolved to different types we are going to be focusing on the CMOS technology that is being used to design these. CMOS is no longer being used. It's Fin FET. If you are more interested, you can go and look up uh, what Fin FET is and how it is used for designing uh, the DDR4 memories, uh, which are much faster. Um, but just to give you guys an, a sense of we are, we are talking about this as an old technology, right? Static RAM and dynamic RAM. Now, where do I use ROM? ROM I use uh, mainly for uh, loading up a bootloader, right? So uh, storing a bootloader. For example, even in your basis three board, uh, there is a, a electrically erasable and programmable ROM. It is the, the memory where the default program that gets loaded onto the FPGA is stored whenever, like the BIOS, exactly. So that's where we are going to be uh, storing our programs that do not get erased when there is loss of power. That's your ROM. Uh, BIOS, for example, or say in our basis three board, that's what uh, the default program gets stored. Uh, so, you know, at the very beginning of the semester, when you got the board, I don't know if you guys switched it on and saw a scrolling message like there was one two three four these characters were continuously scrolling well somebody programmed it that way right so how was it stored well that program that bit file was loaded on to an electrically erasable and programmable rom and whenever you switched it on that was loaded from the rom onboard rom to the fpga and that's what got that's how we programmed it uh, can yes absolutely you can andrew can we you absolutely can it's called electrically erasable and programmable of course you can program it uh, and you know even if you are not able to program it using uh, xilinx vivado there are other uh, programs that, there are other applications that allow you to uh, change the default file program is so expensive yeah they are they are extremely expensive all right so i i think you know we have spent quite a bit of time talking about some general ideas that are uh, around this topic of memory uh, now let's talk about how our class comes into this picture so what have we covered so far well we have started our conversation with k maps boolean algebra all the the relevant fundamental math that goes behind uh, your logic circuits then we you know went on to some uh, a little bit more combinational circuits for example we went talked about muxes we talked about decoders encoders uh, and, and so on so those all those were um, combinational circuits and at the at the, at the, at the in the second half of the course we started talking about sequential circuits we started with a latch we designed a flip flop using that we designed a register using flip flops we also designed counters using flip-flops. And then we talked about some uh, real world applications of flip-flops in terms of finite state machine design. Right, so FSMs, that's, that's sort of how we progressed through the course. Now, a real computer is gonna have various components. One, the computer is supposed to be storing data, right? So we need some sort of memory to store data. 
it might be temporary purpose or it might be a permanent purpose, right? Store data. How are we accomplishing that? Well, maybe RAM or ROM. In today's lecture, we are talking about that to store data. The other thing that a computer would be interested in is uh, printing, uh, all pretending like we are not just watching. What is that? No, I don't. I don't know Ben Eater. Ben Eater is a digital logic YouTube channel. Sure. Okay. He made a six computer on a breadboard. Okay, good to know you guys. All pretend like we are not just watching. All right, I, I, I think I'm going to need to uh, focus on some, I've never heard of this guy, but his YouTube channel looks sick. Well, if it is if his channel looks sick, it is in need of some medicine. <laughs> All right, here, guys, let, let us focus on the material here. Because Ben Eater is not taking the final exam, right? So let's let's just you know focus on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so things to transform data. We need the computer to transform data. Who is going to do that transformation for us? Well, our combinational circuits are going to transform that data. Right, so decoders, encoders, muxes, all of those things are going to be helping us with transforming data. Store memory, transform digital components as combinational circuits. The other thing that we would also need is to move data between things. So what are we gonna use for moving data from between things? Well, we, we would need buses, right? We would need buses and wires to do that job. Yes. And for all of this to happen, we need brains of the operation. The brains of the operation is going to be the control unit, something that can be used to control all these elements. So that's going to be our control unit, which is, in short, a big finite state machine. Essentially, it's going to be sending control signals to various elements, uh, registers, when they, do they need to be uh, read from, when do the registers uh, that are accessible to your CPU, when should they be written to, uh, when should your ALU perform an operation, what operation should your ALU perform, after it computes the result, do you want it to get stored into a memory or not. So all of that, all of that data flow is being controlled by a big finite state machine, which we are going to be calling that as your control unit. So we need a control unit. We need things to transform data. We need things to move data from one to one point to the other. And we also need your RAM and ROM. Now for storing data, we are going to need flip-flops and registers to store data. And if you are talking about large scale storage, then we are going to be looking at RAM, ROM, and many variants, like you guys have pointed out. You guys have pointed out static RAM and dynamic RAM and all those. Those are your variants of memory. We have talked about slow hard disk to a very, very fast cache. Now, in terms of transforming data, we are going to be looking at some combinational logic. For example, an ALU. ALU is quote-unquote big combinational circuit, right? 
from moving data, we are going to need buses, buses that are typically in a tri-state logic, because we may need to, uh, we may need multiple things to access the bus. So we have to make sure that they have a way to disconnect other components and only allow one thing to take charge of the bus. And then like we talked about control unit, biggest uh, finite state machine, which is essentially invisible to the user. The user just bothers about, I have given you an instruction, do that particular instruction, right? And that instruction will have some operation code, it will have an address to where are the where is the data located and so on. But all of the resulting operations that is uh, being initiated and managed by the control unit, they're all invisible to the users. Uh, doesn't it need to only add, subtract to be Turing complete? Okay, yes, but it can do a lot of various operations, right? So uh, if, you if the simplest architecture that you can think of will have a minimum of eight instructions, Th those are, could be like add, subtract, compare, uh, you know, branch when equal and, and so on. Um, but the, 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 uh, a typical, uh, you know, set of operations can be really, really big. Uh, so 256 instructions, uh, is, is, uh, very common. In fact, you can go, uh, go beyond that as well. For each of them, we will have a specific opcode and, and, uh, the control unit monitors that opcode. All right. So let's talk about a memory overview. Over here, we are talking about RAM, random access memory. Now this can be uh, divided. Uh, this is a volatile type of memory. What does volatile mean? If power goes off, the contents are erased, right? So this depends on power. You can have many variations. You can have static RAM, you can have dynamic RAM. There are advantages and disadvantages uh, when you look at these. So static RAM is supposed to be a very high speed memory and it is compatible with CMOS technology. Like I said, we are not talking about the FIN FET technology that is currently being used. We are talking about an, the older version that was used for memory, CMOS. And it has low density, it's not very high density memory. Its density is essentially limited by the number of transistors that are being used to store one bit of data. So here you see that static RAM actually would need six transistors to store one bit. Obviously that is not really ideal if you have a limitation on real estate, right? Uh, there is always a crunch on the space that you use for memory on a printed circuit board. So to serve a purpose of uh, the, the real estate, the space, you would want to go for a high density memory, which the dynamic RAM al allows you to get there. So dynamic RAM or DRAM is, is high speed. It is not hi as high speed as uh, static RAM. However, you only need one transistor and a capacitor which goes through a refresh cycle to store one bit of information. So one transistor per bit. It is not always compatible with CMOS because of the presence of that capacitor. Uh, so that's a disadvantage against the dynamic RAM. And you also need a refresh cycle to continuously update the contents of the capacitor. So for example, over time, if the capacitor discharges, you may need to uh, refresh it to back to its contents. And we'll take a look at how we are doing that in a minute. Uh, you could also have non-volatile RAM, meaning doesn't depend on power here, right? So it doesn't depend on power. Example, flash memory, really high density. So now on average, uh, what do you mean by CMOS compatibility? Remember, whenever we talk, uh, we, when we talked about CMOS transistors, we were talking about a, uh, a pull down network and a pull up network, the use of NMOS and PMOS transistors in a complementary fashion. Right, that's exactly right, Andrew. So the 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 
the zeros and ones, right? So the, the things that are being stored in memory are zeros and ones. They are typically voltage levels. So if you want to be consistent or compatible with CMOS, the same ranges of zeros and ones have to be agreed upon, right? So have to be uh, consistent. Yes, that's right. All right, so let's see. Flash memory, high density on average, it requires less than one transistor per bit, but it is a, a, a slightly slower uh, type of memory just because the, the sizes can be bigger here. Uh, a read-only memory, ROM. ROM is a non-volatile type of memory in which, um, let's talk about what, what could be inputs to this ROM and what could be outputs of this ROM. So let's talk about input and output to a ROM. Read only memory. What could be the input and what should be an output to a ROM? Input determines what will be read. Output is what is read. Okay, Bennett, you're absolutely right. So what should I, uh, is, uh, not instructions, um, so input determines what will be read, right, address, right? So what will be read is essentially the address location. And output is the data at that address. So address should be part of the input and data at that address should be part of the output, right? Because I'm only reading it. So input should be what? Address and output should be data at that address data at that address but just to give it some more functionality i will say apart from address let us also have an input called read request essentially being used to say okay i want to read it now and i don't want to read it now so another additional input that will activate that read operation. But that this is essentially it, right? chip enabled, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So you have your address and you have read request as your inputs and output is essentially data at that address. Now I want you guys to start picturing this. Using these two statements, I want to show you guys something. Uh, let's see, I will take a squared paper here. Um, and let's see, I'm going to arbitrarily draw up a, a, a few uh, logic gates, right? So I'll say uh, I have an AND gate here, I have an AND gate here, uh, one, two, three, four, sure, and then I have an OR gate here. One, two, three, four. Uh, what type of uh, circuit is this? Uh, uh, sure, SOP, but combinational, right? Can I say it's a combinational circuit as opposed to a sequential circuit? Okay, so it's a combinational circuit, has some inputs, has some output, right? So what if I give it uh, an input like 1011? If I give it an input of 1011, what is the output here? Sure, it is a one. So think of it, think of this as an address. Think of this as the data at that address. You guys see that? So think of this as address and think of this as data at that address. And as you are changing the inputs, your data stored at that address is changing, but that data depends on the address value only. That's right. The data over here is dependent only on the address, right? So if you wanted to store something else in the ROM 
all you would need to change is the combinational logic that is present over here. And you could do that using, uh, you know, electrically, like EE prom, like a electrically erasable and programmable ROM, where you are essentially changing logic cells. But what are you getting? You have an address and you get data at that address, essentially functioning as a ROM. You guys see that? So, in other words, I can think of a ROM as a combinational logical circuit, combinational logic circuit, where the inputs to the combinational circuit is an address and the output is data at that address, right? And you know, you could, you could have situations where you have uh, one output from a combinational circuit, or you could have, uh, be the, right you could include you could include even that as an enable uh, as an, an additional input sure you can do that so you can have one going here and here uh, 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 so you can have one and one right something like that so that could be your uh, read request Or you could also use read request as, uh, you know, a, 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 to control, to put the output in a high impedance state. So all of those things are, you know, uh, an option for the designer. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is a ROM can be as simple as a combinational circuit where you have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Your inputs are being treated as an address and your output is treated as data at that address. So if you are given a combinational circuit, you can literally find out, you can fill in a table such as this, right? So if I give you any combinational circuit, you could literally tell me address and data at that address. That is going to have a, a massive K map because now you are, you are talking about more number of inputs, right? But the, but the, but the, but the issue is not to have the simplest implementation. You can obviously do this in software uh, and, and keep changing it. Uh, that seems difficult to program though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do Every address needs its own custom logic circuit. Uh, not every address. You do that for a set of addresses. And if you need to change something, all you need to change is the, the, how that particular input combination is changed. We'll talk about, you know, how it is, how this is, how all of this is done using, uh, you know, different objectives, uh, different uh, components. We can also do this using decoders and transistors and even diodes. So we'll take a look at all of those things. Right now, I'm just trying to convey the, the concept of ROM being considered as a combinational circuit. Uh, yeah, you, you, this is right now one bit, but that's not going to be a general case, right? You will have eight bits or 16 bits and, and so on stored at that particular address. So you could have something like, oh yeah, there is a combinational circuit here, which has four in or multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Sure, you can have that. And we'll take a look at some examples of how, where we, we, we see this. All right, let's come back to this. So read only memory, you can start thinking of that as a combinational circuit where input address, output data at that address. Now let's talk about how a RAM structure array of logic cells are put together. Now at the beginning, you might think that there are, there are so many things going on with this diagram, but we are going to take a look at everything in detail we are also going to figure out why this is labeled as a 16 by 4 static RAM array. So a static RAM array lit has static RAM cells and each static RAM cell that is highlighted over here in yellow can store one bit of information. So let's, uh, let's go all the way over uh, to the right here. A0, A1, A2, A3, what are those? 
as the, the name suggests over here, this is an address decoder, right? So A0, A1, A2, A3 are literally a four bit address. So this is a four bit address. Whenever you think about a memory, those are your inputs, yes. Whenever you think about the memory, you think about two things. One, address. Two, data at that address. In some cases, you may want to write to the memory and in some cases, you may want to read from the memory. For a static RAM, are you reading or writing? Both. You are doing both here, right? You are, you, are, you are going to change contents of the RAM and you are going to also read uh, contents of the RAM. So you're doing both here. Not the same case with ROM. ROM, you're only reading it uh, in general, right? So you, you change it once in a while, but you're generally using that as a read-only device. Okay, so you all the way to the left here, you have got a four-bit address and a0 clearly is the least significant bit of the address. A3 is your most significant bit of the address. Now, all of that is going into an address decoder. In other words, a decoder, which is being used to decode your address uh, input. Now, if you have a four bit address, then how many different address locations will you have 16 that's exactly right so with a 4-bit address you can generate 16 different locations at which you will have some data stored right but you will have 16 different uh, rows that is exactly the reason why the size of this is indicated as 16 16 also happens to be the number of word lines. Number of word lines. And I'm going to use WL to talk about a word line. What is a word line? These are all outputs of the address decoder. So for example, whenever I enter a 4-bit address over here, I am going to get a specific word line to be active. So let's just take a let's just take an example here. Let us say I have my input address that I'm trying to either write to or read from. Uh, let us take an arbitrary address, 4-bit address. Uh, let's say I have 0, 0, 1, 1, right? So can you guys tell me which word line is going to be active in this case? Word line 12 is going to be active in this case because I'm going to read this as 1100. 1100 corresponds to 12, uh, which I have zero here, I have one here and all the way down to 15. So I can, you know, let us say this is 12. Right, so only that guy is going to be active and all the others are going to be inactive, right? In other words, I will be able to read from or write to these four logic cells, static RAM cells, given this particular address. So I can read to them or write to them. Now, let us suppose I want to write, um, I want to write, uh, let's see, I'm going to say store or write uh, B in hex. And I'm writing that hex character at uh, same same address location 1100 uh, 1100 would be C in hex right right so 
uh, I'm writing that at C, the data I'm writing is at is B. So B is, as you pointed out, is 1011 in base 2. And C is 1100 in base 2. So we have, I've taken care of the address here, right? This is the address. And this is the data at that address. So I've taken care of C in hex. 1100 is the address, yes. Now, how do I store B in that particular location? The first thing that I need to do, give this guy that corresponding address. I've given it 1100. Next, I need to do the enable. That's absolutely right. I have to take care of this guy. I have to enable it. And this is right enable. It's an active high right enable input. It's an active high input. So I need to activate that, right? So I need to make that one. Once I make this this one, you see that is connected to all the right drivers. So these are essentially uh, is it, yes, it is synchronously writing four bits to the four static RAM cells at once. Absolutely right. It is uh, synchronous. So that enables that essentially gets the driver ready so as to take the input bits and allow the static RAM cell to get those particular input bits. So you have the input bits indicated over there, right? So I'm going to highlight them here as this guy. So what are these? These are data that the user might be interested in writing to the four static RAM cells of a particular word line. It looks like all the D in are tied together. No, they are. Uh, that is the right enable. They are not supposed to be tied together. So that's that that green line is for the right enable. So D in zero is input to the right driver, which is going to get delivered in true form and the complemented form to the static RAM cell. So D in zero gets delivered to these guys. D in one gets delivered to these guys. D in two for these guys and D in three for these guys. Precharge is essentially getting the right driver to recognize D in zero and be able to deliver complemented and true form to the static RAM cell. So what really happens is, as you can see here, if I zoom in, how does each static RAM cell look like? Well, first, you have two lines in red coming from the top. Those are word line, right? So this is word line 12. And then on the sides, you see two things that are coming out of the right driver. One indicated with positive, the other indicated as negative. So that literally is the data in true form d in zero and this guy is d in zero complement so both d in zero and d in zero complement both true and uh, the uh, complemented version and true version are being uh, written to the static ram cell why are they two inputs in red uh, there is, there are two inputs because this is controlling the gate. There, there are six transistors in here, inside the static cell. The, these two inputs are going to essentially control the gate uh, voltage of two NMOS transistors. So in the later slide, we will take a look at what goes inside this. 
So this is essentially controlling, are you giving access to the static RAM cell or not? Uh, what is the point of writing both true and complemented form to the memory? So the point is this, the way six transistors are being laid inside this static cell, give us the ability to check both true and complemented form. Again, there is a feedback loop of two cross coupled NOT gates inside that. So when you take a look at that, you will see why both are uh, good to have. Sure, you can, you, you, you don't need to read both. Uh, and, you know, the right driver is actually generating uh, true and complemented forms. Uh, so, no, uh, nothing to worry about as far as the user is concerned. All the user does is, they just make the data available that is supposed to be written to that particular location. So, in our case, we need to do what? We need to write B into it. B is 1011. So let's see, what should I do here? Uh, the least significant bit is all the way to the left. So I need to make this one, this one, this zero, and this one. Yeah? So that's B. I have already given C to the address lines. They got decoded. And once they got decoded, word line 12 became active and all the others became inactive. Once word line 12 has become active, and you have made the right enable active and you have given the four bit input that needs to be stored at that location, the right drivers are going to make those uh, bits available both in true and complemented forms for the static RAM cell. And because your word line is active right now, you will get access because this is active. You will get access to the cell in which those can be written. We'll take a look at more details of inside the static RAM cell on the next slide. But right now I want you to note that there is an input to the right and left corresponding to true and complemented forms. And there are two inputs from the top corresponding to the word line inputs. This is per cell, right? So that's how you're writing one zero one one to that particular cell now what happens when you want to read it well when you want to read it you need to give the same address because we are trying to read at what is written to one one zero zero so you have to give the same address you have to disable write enable and then by using this sensing amplifiers you are looking at both those lines right so all this is connected to the same line those are actually called bit lines. So in gray, what you see here is bit line. So our architectures are essentially going to be a grid of word lines and bit lines. Word lines are essentially uh, corresponding to the address and bit lines are corresponding to the data. And for each cell, we not only have the bit line, we also have the bit line complemented versions as well. So when you read it, hopefully with the same address, you should read zero, oh sorry, not zero, one zero one one using the sense amplifiers. Now let's talk about the size of the array, right? This is a static RAM array because each of the cell that is going in here is a static RAM cell, which has six transistors to store, which requires six transistors to store one bit of information. Next, why, so 16, why 16? Because those are the number of word lines. Why four? Why do you guys think that that's four? Number of bit lines, uh, the size of the word, okay. No, 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 four bit address, 4-bit address corresponds to 16 address locations. That's why you got 16. And at 16 locations, at each location, how many bits are stored? Four bits are stored, right? So your, your, this is four because four bits stored, uh, four bits stored at each address. There are 16 of them, right? Let me also you write what WL means and what BL means. 
WL is word line and BL I'm using for bit line. Uh, where word and D word come from? Yes, that's right. Now, we have talked about, uh, actually in a lot of detail uh, about the goal, right? So we want our memories that you need to store one bit of information. You don't want that to be very high. You don't want that to be as high as three transistors per bit. What you really want in order for you to be able to have a very high dense uh, memory, you want to go to one transistor per DRAM cell per uh, bit. You only should need one transistor. So how do you get this? Well, you will have to go from six transistors to a three transistor DRAM cell all the way to one transistor per DRAM cell. Plus you may also need a capacitor that will re require a refresh cycle. So we'll talk about how your, the, but the goal is so that we can have a very high dense memory. So you can fit it into, uh, does that depend on the transistor technology used? Yes, it absolutely does. So DRAM is not necessarily uh, compatible with CMOS. Static RAM is. So I told you guys that a static RAM cell has six transistors. And I also told you that they are the, the, the static RAM is compatible with CMOS. So inside the static RAM cell, you guys, uh, one over eight per bit. Yes. So, uh, there are two variations of static RAM. It also comes in six or eight transistors. The, the one that we are looking at is six transistors. So where are the six transistors? This is the cell, right? So this is the cell that we were looking at earlier. Two things coming from the top that were corresponding to word lines, right? And there were two bit lines running by the sides. One was bit line, the other was the complemented version. Uh, that's right. So there are two transistors in here and here and there is one here and one here so that makes four trans uh, six transistors per static ram cell now what is inside this well if you look at what is this that is essentially our two cross coupled cross coupled not gates before we looked at the static uh, sr latch we also looked at a bistable element of two cross uh, two not gates that were in that configuration before we looked at the nor version of sr latch the problem with this uh, not gate for the user was that we didn't have enough inputs to control what gets uh, uh, what gets stored Yes, this is absolutely stable. And we can take a look at this, right? So suppose you want to um, write something to the static RAM cell. Well, for that, you need to make this active, right? You, may, you, you need to make the word line active first. Once you need to make the first, uh, word line active, the gate voltage of these two NMOS transistors is going to be high, which essentially means you now have access to the cross coupled configuration. Until then, if this was zero, these would have put the transistors in an off state, thereby disconnecting the, uh, the two cross coupled NOT gates from the bit lines. Hi Z, that's right. So now what do we have? We have, once the word line is one, now this, that allows something to be written or to be read and we are using the same port for reading as well as writing we are using the same bit lines to read and write the only difference is the write enable the write enable was used to write and when that was disabled you were reading provided you were giving the correct address so 
suppose you want to write one, right? So if you want to write one to it, what happens? There's a zero available there from the right driver. If this guy is one, now you're writing one over here, right? So that one makes this guy a one. That zero, that makes this guy a zero. That zero will make this one, that one will make this zero. And what, what you're going to have is a stable state. And this is also a bistable element. So the other state is going to be when the bit line was zero. And you will be able to write to it, you will be able to read from it. But the thing to note is we are using six transistors, not very efficient in terms of space. Uh, and we are also using the same two bit lines, same ports to read and write. Right. So read and write use the same port. There is one word line and two bit lines. The bit lines are, uh, you know, the, they are not two independent bit lines. The bit lines are carrying the same data here. All right. So that goes inside the static RAM cell with six transistors. Now let's take a look at the dynamic RAM cell. So a dynamic RAM cell, as pointed out earlier, uh, was that why can't you just use one NOT gate? Well, there can be other variations of this, right? You can, you can have other, other ways to just hold on to one data. But the way you get memory, the way you get, uh, you know, you get to feedback is by using feedback, right? So the, the way we have implemented memory is by the use of feedback. Uh, are these all CMOS transistors? Yes, that's why we said we have, we have compatibility with C CMOS. Now let's talk about dynamic RAM. Earlier when we looked at 16 by four static RAM array, in that we had 16 static RAM cells altogether. Now in this case, if we replaced each static RAM cell with a dynamic RAM cell in which you have one capacitor and one transistor per dynamic RAM cell, you would get 16 transistors and 16 cells for the same 16 by 4 dynamic RAM array. Again, we have word lines and bit lines. Over here, word lines are the output of the address decoder. And then the bit lines are being used to write or read the contents of whatever is stored in that particular DRAM cell. Right, so this is relevant to the data and this is relevant to the address. So because we are using, so all we are doing is we are using the word line to give access. Uh, well, that can be small or high. Generally, you go by uh, the refresh cycle. So in this case, uh, we are using a refresh cycle of 64 milliseconds. Notice that this is old technology. I'm, I'm not sure about the exact uh, number. Um, deep depletion of FET, yes. So how are we writing it? Well, make word line active. Once you make word line active, you are saying that this is going to give access for me to change the voltage across that capacitor. Yes. So once I change the voltage across the capacitor, that is going to take some time to be to to decay 64 milliseconds so every 64 milliseconds we are doing a refresh cycle to bring back the contents of the capacitor back to their original state so suppose we do this suppose there is a threshold here where above this is considered as high and below this is considered as low. On the x-axis, we have time. And what we are monitoring here is the voltage across the capacitor. So at the beginning, if you have a zero stored in your dynamic RAM cell, then your voltage is going to be low and you may not need to refresh. However, if, your, uh, if you now write a one, which is essentially make word line active and make bit line one. If you do that, then you would have written a one to the capacitor, which means that your capacitor is now charged to VCC, whatever the, the supply voltage is. 
then what is going to happen? Well, if you now don't keep that voltage at that level, it is going to slowly discharge. And as it is discharging, it might go into the low state from the high state. You don't want that. You still want your one to be held in the capacitor. So what do you do? Every once in a while, do you refresh? So update the contents of the dynamic ram cell by refreshing the capacitor voltage back to its original level. So D, how do you monitor, how do you carry this out? Well, degraded contents are being read by a D latch and if they cross a certain, uh, if they if they come to a certain value, they, uh, or based on time, they get updated again. So you're monitoring the degraded contents and you're restoring them after every 64 milliseconds. Or if you had, you know, a bigger capacitor, you might need to do this slower. However, a bigger capacitor will take up more space. So the, the benefit of dynamic RAM is that you only need one transistor, but the disadvantage is that you need a refresh cycle. Now let's talk about how these dynamic RAM cells are put together in an array form and how do you uh, so the goal is to have a small cap with multiple refresh uh, cycles yes so it's a it's a it, uh, it, it's a um, trade-off it's a trade-off between size and uh, how uh, how often do you need to refresh so for a 64k by 1 DRAM array. How are you going to read and write to this particular array? So before we actually do this, let's talk about uh, the size of RAM first, right? So we, we talked about it before, but I also want to sort of write it explicitly over here. Size of RAM is indicated by number of word lines by number of bits at each word line. And you can also rewrite this same thing as number of word lines are two raised to number of address bits. How many bits are you uh, having to refer each address location? number of address bits by same thing number of data bits at each address location so earlier we had what we had uh, two raised to four, four bits for array by four, right? That's why we had 16 by four earlier. Now using this, let's talk about 64K by one. So what does 64K by one mean? Let's talk about the easy thing first. Why is it? Why do you think it is 64k and not 65k we one address uh no no so the first one is related to the number of bits in the address and the second one is related to the number of bits stored at that address right over here the numbers that are given are 64k by 1. 2 raised to 6? No, 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 no. So how many address lines are there? Eight. Okay, so sure. There are eight uh, address lines to pick one from 256, eight of them are being used to refer to one of the eight 
uh, sorry, one of the 256 rows, right? So here, look at this array. This That's where your RAM is. It has 256 rows and 256 columns. I need eight bits to pick one row and I need eight bits to pick one column. After I pick a row and a column, then I will be able to talk about one bit that is at that particular junction. So the number of bits that you are storing at each location is just one. However, you are using eight bits for row and eight bits for column. Now let us see what you guys um, what you guys feel like uh, in terms of column and row. Which should I provide for this first? Should I provide the column first or the row first? Okay, Bennett says row. Uh, I want to highlight one word here. The word is latch versus decoder. Look at the latch versus a decoder. Column first, right. So what you do here is you provide the eight bits for column first. Those will be latched because what you're doing is you're taking that column address using this particular small control unit you are giving that to another block which has com latches multiplexer and demultiplexer and because we are doing a column what we are going to do is we are going to need to indicate whether you're talking about the row or the column. So for that reason, we have these two inputs. We have an active low row address select. And similarly, we have a, an active low column address select. And then we have this uh, active low right enable, active low right enable. And this becomes our address. So first what you do, you make, give the eight bit address, make a row address select inactive, make column address select active. And if you are, uh, writing to this memory, then you will also uh, act, make active the write enable. Those will be given to this set of latches, multiplexer and demultiplexer. So column latches are being used to essentially take that eight, uh, eight bit column information, eight bit address corresponding to the column, latch that and then use that to pick one of the 256 columns from the user, from the address, right? So wherever the user is uh, giving an address, that's all the addresses are, by the way, generated by a CPU, right? So the processor is sending all those uh, addresses along with the control unit managing all the other control signals that are associated. But the address is coming from the CPU. So the column latches, the, so that 8 bit is going to be used to pick one of the 256. Then you, what are you going to do? You have already picked the column. You have lashed it. Don't need to worry about that. Then you are going to use the same address, 8 bit address for a row decoding operation, which means then you are going to pick one row. Once you pick the column first and then the, the row, Remember there are 256 rows and 256 columns here. 
then you, what are you going to get? You are going to get accessibility to that particular location, one bit location. You may want to write something into that or you may want to read the RAM. So when you are using D in, what are you using? Are you using multiplexer or demultiplexer? So I'm going to highlight this as green. If you are writing something into the memory, are you going to take this D in and demultiplex it into 256 columns? Or are you going to take this D in and multiplex it into 256 columns? It's not the same address. It's a 16 bit address. Eight row, eight column. All right, so next, what do we have? Demultiplex, that's absolutely right. So what you're going to do is, you are going to take this input bit and the question is, where does it go? Well you are going to use a demultiplexer to take this input bit and make sort of a demultiplexer that is being used to make that same bit available at 256 different columns. And depending on which column is being selected by the column latches, it will be available to be written to that. Column, column decoding is hop happening through this cycle here. So that's your uh, demultiplexer. And obviously when you are trying to read, right? So, so that is for writing. And when you are trying to read, you are going to do a mu multiplexer, right? I hope you guys see that. You're gonna be using the multiplexer for reading operation because all these columns, 256, 256, 21, D out. Uh, you said the same address is being used by both. No, 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 no. It is a different address. So it's a 16 bit address generated by the CPU. Half of it is for row address, half of it is for column. First, the column is going to go into this and based on the latches, we are going to be pointing towards one of the 256 columns. Then the eight bits for the rows are going to go through the decoder and point to one of the 256 rows. All right, so what, what do we have next? Uh, let's see. Oh, I forgot about the size. So now let's take a look at the size. Earlier in our equation, we had two raised to the number of address bits multiplied by number of bits at each location. In our case, we have two raised to 16 by one. You guys see that by one. 2 raised to 256 because 8 for row, 8 for column, which essentially equals what? 2 raised to 6 multiply, oh, sorry, 2 raised to 6 by 2 raised to 10 uh, and then by 1. What is this? That is K. What is this? That is 64 and then by 1 carries over. The fact that DRAM size is a power of two doesn't seem K is one zero two four. Two raised to ten. You guys have been talking about KB all this while. MB that K was two raised to ten always. In the analog world, analog world K means 1000. In the digital world, it means 1024. All right, so let's see. That's how you're getting 64K by one. Uh, this is also called as a two dimensional decoding. Two dimensional decoding. And the reason why it's called two dimensional decoding is because you are doing a decoding for the columns as well as for the rows. 
So that's a two dimensional decoding. If you just picked one row, then you, then you would have a one, um, one dimensional decoding in that case. To the, took the last week to figure out that out. <laughs> All right, so I suppose you guys see how the row address happens, column address happens, latch. All right, so that's that should be a good. All right, now let's move on to uh, read-only memories. So this is, like I said, it's used to store programs. For example, the boot ROM for personal computers, or you could be having complete applications for embedded systems. In your basis three boards, you are using that for storing sort of a default startup a program that gets loaded onto the FPGA every time you power it on, which can be changed, but that's what is being used to store it on a permanent basis or at least a semi-permanent basis. But like we said earlier, ROM is actually a combinational circuit, which look, which basically is a two table lookup. You give me an address, I will tell you what is at that address. So you can think of it as address input being the inputs to the function itself and the outputs would be the function outputs. Just as we drew some SOP circuit and we said, okay, now we can talk about address and out output is the data at that address. So this is talking about the same concept that we have, we have, we have gone over earlier. So I had taken some arbitrary combinational logic. Let us take this combinational logic here. And I suppose you guys agree with me that this is combinational. Logic gates where your signal is moving from the input to the output. Outputs are all a specific, outputs depend on the combination of the current inputs. What do we have in terms of inputs? We have I0, I1 and polarity as our inputs. It's a three bit input in, in this case. How many outputs do I have? I have Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. I have a four bit, uh, four bit. Uh, it, it is not an inverter. It is actually a signal that is being used to um, have active low outputs versus active high outputs. So when you look, when we take a look at the, the truth table, you will see what that polarity is being used as. But the, 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 the point is this, the point is three inputs here, and there are four outputs. Using that information, can you guys make sense of this? The size of this ROM is eight by four. Why is this eight and why is that four? This guy is eight because two raised to three. And that is four because at each address location, you have four bits that are stored. You guys see that? So eight corresponds to the uh, number of address locations. And in this case, we have three bits be being used for uh, each address. So our number of address locations are eight. And at each address, we have the ability to store four bits. So let's take a look at the truth table here. What do you guys see? On the left side, we have inputs to the uh, circuit. On the right side, we have outputs, three inputs and four outputs. A2 is being used as polarity, by the way. So A2 is being used as the polarity. So if you notice, this is simply a, a, a decoding operation. Is that a decoder? Can you guys say that this is a decoder? Absolutely. So what is the difference then? Are there two decoders or is this just one decoder? This is actually one decoder in which if the polarity is zero, then it is functioning as an active low output. For the, for the outputs of the decoder, it's, it is just a two to four decoder, two inputs, four outputs. But this additional input called polarity or A2 is being used to express the output in the active low form 
for the first half for the top of the truth table and then in the other case it is active high when it is 1. But it is decoding 0, 1, 2 and 3. Right? So it is functioning as a 2 to 4 decoder with this additional sort of criteria of polarity. So outputs could be active high, low or outputs could be active high. So we came up with the truth table. Using the truth table, we have put in a combinational circuit. And it doesn't really matter how we have drawn this up. It is some combinational circuit that is representative of the same truth table here. So let us try to find out what is stored at each address location. Let us try to do that. There is a ROM, right? So all we are interested in is address. What is stored at that address? So what is stored at address 000? At 000, you have 1110 being stored. What is that? E in hex. You guys see that? So at address zero uh, or at address location zero zero zero, the number, the address is zero zero zero. What is stored at that? E, D, B, seven, blah, 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 all the way down to eight. So you give me an address. I will tell you what is at that address. They are located, they are connected through a truth table. Questions about this? So you can ask a question like this, right? Like what, what is stored? What is stored? I'm trying to read it. I only need to read a read only ROM, right? What is stored at location 110? Question mark. It's not super useful, but this is the first thing that we are looking at to make that connection that ROMs are essentially a lookup table. What is stored at 110? Four. All right, let's move on take a look at a slightly bigger ROM. First things first, what is it? It's a multiplier, four by four multiplier. So if you give me six, uh, eight bits, half of them are here multiplied by half of them here, four bits by four bits. So if you give me eight bits, I will multiply them and I'll get a output, eight bit output. So it's a multiplier, another combinational circuit. So let's talk about why the size is 256 by eight. The 256 is related to the number of inputs, right? How many inputs do I have? Eight of them. So two raised to uh, eight. So this is like a rainbow table password cracking. Yes, it is exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So two, 256 is coming from two raised to eight because you have got eight inputs. Four of them being uh, used in this example as the multiplicand and four of them being used as the multiplier. Two numbers being multiplied. And of course it is commutative so it can work the other way as well. X with Y or Y with X should give you the same product. So how about eight? Why are they output eight? Well, at each address location you have got eight bits that are stored. So that's why you have eight. You can see that. So the size of this ROM is 256 by eight. You tell me an eight bit input, eight bit address. I will tell you an eight bit or one byte that is stored at that particular address. And we can, we can do this, uh, so there's no truth table because the truth table is going to be uh, too big. So what we can do is this, we can say what is stored at some location, right? So we can navigate this. What is stored, what is stored 
at address 7f. So if you go, if you guys want to know what is stored at location or uh, at address 7f, then you need to look at one row, one column. That row could be for 7 and the column could be for f, right? So where is the row for 7? Uh, maybe I use yellow for the row. It is right here. Then the column is seven. Maybe I use green for that. Where is that? All the way at the corner there. So what is the value? Six, nine. So if you take seven and you take 15, you multiply them, you will get the decimal equivalent of 69, right? 69 is, the, they're all stored in hex right now. So if you convert 69 in hex to decimal, you will get the same thing as multiplying seven with 15. And because it is commutative, you could have gone the other way. You could have taken seven and uh, let's see, you could have taken seven and F instead of this. So seven here and F here, right? You would have gotten the same result there. So, Give me an 8-bit address, I will tell you the byte that is stored over there. Questions about this? All right, let's go on and look at how can we make the internal structure of a ROM but the first thing that we are going to do is use diodes. And when you put diodes in specific locations, you will essentially be making a truth table. So what we have here is a three to eight decoder over here, seven, four, X, one, three, eight, with three inputs, three enables that are already hardwired such that the decoder is enabled and you have got eight active low outputs. We talked about that, Andrew. Bootloader, BIOS, uh, some default program that needs to get uh, executed at the very beginning uh, of, of operation, right? So that would be where the uh, kernel goes, right? So whenever you're uh, turning on your computer, the, the, the bootloader, that it gets up, uh, uploaded into the memory, uh, it, but it is getting there from the ROM. That's where it is used in real computers. All right, so let's see. I've got all of that over here. Then I've got a mesh of diodes and I've selectively put diodes in certain locations and I've not put diodes in certain other locations. And at the very end, I've got some inverting buffers and I've got an output. So the first question that I'll ask you guys is this, what is the size of this ROM? Eight by four, eight by eight, eight by four, is correct. The reason is eight because this is three and four because at each location I've got four outputs, right? In other words, eight is because I have eight word lines and I've got at each word line, I will be able to access four bits. Those are going to be number of bit lines. The decoder would be eight by eight. That's right. But we are looking at, so we are actually looking at the internal structure of the ROM, which means I am actually controlling where the diodes go 
that will dictate what kind of truth table it results in right so the location of the diodes is what is crucial here and then i can program it to be different thereby getting a different truth table all i have to do is change the location of the diodes in fact i will use this to uh, so the diode replaces the nand basically uh well not necessarily uh in this case we our our diodes are essentially controlling L let me go through this and i'll try to you know bring it all together the size of this is 8 by 4 right it is 8 because you have got 3 uh not that 3 this is 3 3 inputs so 2 raised to 3 number of word lines and i've got here as 4 because i have got four outputs you give me a 3 bit address and i'll tell you a 4 bit data that is stored at that address now let us try to figure out what is stored at address 5 right so the input is 5 my goal is to find out what is stored at that location 5 well 5 is what 101 so i've given it 101 over here once you know this is 101 can you guys tell me what output is going to be active well as the diagram suggests only this guy is going to be active why 5 that's it everything else is going to be inactive inactive in this case means high right everything else is high except for wi-fi that is the only thing that is low because it's the active low output for the 741138 chip now if you look at this there are a bunch of diodes that are located at certain locations here the, 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 uh, uh, at the cross junction here there is only one diode that is on currently which one is it <laughs> that one <laughs> it is this guy every other diode is right now off why are why is everybody off i have got a plus 5 volt connected to the anode and i've got a high voltage on the cathode high to high that's right so all the other diodes are not allowing any current to flow through them they are they are an open circuit they are off right now the only diode that is on is the diode over here which is essentially controlling that output d1 underscore l so that is the only guy that is going to be low all the other outputs are going to be directly connected to high this is the only guy that is going to be connected to low because that's the only diode that is high right now uh, that is on right now what that means is on your output this is going to be high low high high and notice what happens if you invert it if you use these inverters and there is a reason why you're using these inverters if you use these inverters these are called output inverting buffers we need them if you use those output buffers only then you will get the data as 0 1 0 0 so what is stored at 5 you have uh, 2 stored at 5 see that all of this is 2 right 0 0 1 1 uh, 0 0 1 0 that's in decimal or hex two. I'm confused about how the flow of electricity, why is it high, low, low, high? What do you mean? Why? Is... So if this guy is turned on, then what do you mean? That, that essentially means that there is a connection between the input of this and this particular output because all the other so that is like saying all that 5 volts is dropping across this uh, resistor and 
the input of this um, inverter is directly connected to the output over there. That's what makes it low. The output is connected to the decoder. Yes, the Wi-Fi is not connected to the input here until this diode is on. You see, the diode is essentially either connecting the word lines, uh, either connecting these guys or disconnecting them. So when they were when they were all off, they were all disconnecting it, right? There, there was no connection at all. But because this turned on, now there is a connection. That's why it became now a low. All right, now I want you guys to notice this. We Have we seen this before? We have absolutely seen this before. Where did we see it before? Right here. You see, when you enter five, you get two. So that diode structure that we just saw was an internal ROM structure for this eight by four ROM. Now I want you to, to get this. Look at where are the zeros and ones in this truth table? Where are they? Well, in the first four places, in the first four rows, the zeros are diagonal. Everything else is one. And in the bottom four cases, there is a one in the diagonal and everything else is a zero. This directly relates to where are the diodes and where are they absent in this. Absent, 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 absent. Everything else, there is a diode. That's the top half. So that means wherever there is a zero, don't put it. Don't put the diode there. Wherever there is a one, put a diode there. Similarly, over here. Diode, 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 diode. One, 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 one. Everything else, there's no diode. So wherever there is a zero, don't put a diode there. Wherever there's a one, put a diode there. But this works because of these, these inverters. If you did not have these output inverting buffers, then your data would have been flipped completely, right? So that is the reason you can follow all that and you will have to invert them at the end. That's the use of the output inverting buffers. Now, would you classify this as one dimensional decoding or would you classify that as two dimensional decoding? Is it one dimensional or two dimension? It is 1D, that's right. It is 1D because you're only decoding rows. You're doing nothing for the columns. In other words, if you did two dimensional decoding, then you will only have one bit accessible at the very end. Now you are able to access four bits at each location. So that means that you're only picking one row. And so you're doing one dimensional decoding in this case. All right. Uh, in the few minutes that I have left, I also want to do this particular example. This is an example of two dimensional decoding which means that you are doing the row selection as well as the column selection. Let's do first things first. What is the size of this ROM? Take a look at everything in detail. How many inputs, how many outputs? Eight by, no, no, no. Guys, you, this used to be a final exam problem. Uh, 128 by 1 looks right. It is 128 over here because you have 7 address bits. 2 raised to 7 would give you 128. In other words, you have got 128 different locations in your memory. And at each location, how many, how many uh, are you able to 
uh, change or read. You are not changing, you are just reading. At each location, your output is simply 1. Oh, you missed the bottom. Yeah, yeah. So you have got three most significant input uh, address bits for the 3 to 8 decoder here, and then four least significant address inputs for selecting the column here. So let's see. Uh, let us find out what is stored at some address location. Let us say what is stored at 7E. Let's try to see that. Uh, question is what is stored at 7e in hex so what is 7e let us try to write it down over here 7e would be 0 1 1 1 and then e would be 1 1 1 0 yeah and then let's also number them. This would be A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, right? And then there is no A7. So I can I can literally sort of move this zero all the way over here. That's it. 0, 1, 1, 1, yes. Uh, I think you're missing one. I think that is, uh, uh, that is, that is okay. All right, so let me translate that over here. So if I translate this over here, uh, I've got A4, A5, A6 to be all ones. And then I've got A0 as zero, everything else is a one. Uh, I, I have to drop the most significant, right? Okay, so if A4 is 1, A5 is 1, A6 is 1, can you guys tell me which uh, which output is going to be active? Which particular row is going to be active? 7. Alright, so this guy is going to be active. Okay, next. If A0, A1, A2, A3 or A3, A2, A1, A0 are 1, 1, 1, 0, which output over here is going to be active? It's a, it, it's a multiplexer. So 14, so here, these are select inputs. These are data inputs, that is your data output. So based on these four bits, you are essentially picking one out of 16 to go through. Which one? 14. So let's highlight 14 here. If I highlight 14 there, uh, let me use a different color. So what is happening there? There is a 5 volt connected over there. There's a resistor and it is controlling the uh, anode voltage across each of the diodes. So if there is a diode present over there, what is the voltage at this point? What is the voltage there? Low or high? The decoder outputs were active low. So what is the voltage over there? Low or high? Low. That's right. Only that diode is on right now, which makes that cross connection happen. That will go to low in that case. And because of this bubble, what do you get for D0? You get a 1. In other words, if there is a diode present, you get a 1. If there is no diode present, you get a 0 stored at that location. You guys see that? And you're able to do this for 128 different locations at which you can store one bit or actually you're, you're just reading in this case because it's a ROM uh, and this falls under the category of two-dimensional decoding row decoding and column decoding from here uh, there's a very nice quickly see the word yeah that's right 
Okay, let us stop recording over here and we will